Impressions. Let's talk about step two in this process of uh, making a crown. Okay. So to summarize, you know, the idea is that we want to make a mold of what the tooth looks like. So this is helpful because then we can make a crown off of this mold. Otherwise, you're not going to keep the patient there overnight and just, oh, let me try this wax pattern on and off your actual tooth. Right? You can send the patient home. You got a mold that you can work off of. Okay? So this mold needs to be pretty accurate because it's got to reflect what the patient's mouth looks like too. Right? So some of the questions that we got for you are, so what are the types of impression materials? Okay, how do we get the tissue out of the way? And we'll talk about why that's important. And then how do you evaluate or what are the critical parts of a good impression? All right, so just a definition, a negative imprint of an oral structure used to produce a positive replica of the structure to be used as a permanent record or the production of a dental restoration or prosthesis. So there's a few things that are going to be key for uh, an impression material. So you've listed six things. So it's sufficiently fluid to adapt to the oral tissues, right? We want it to flow so that it kind of gets into all the nooks and crannies. So, but it's also got to be viscous enough so that it's contained in a tray. Because if it's too runny, guess what? It's all going to flow out, and then you're not going to have anything left in your tray when you seed it in the mouth. So you're kind of balancing those two aspects. You got to be able to set, uh, able to set to a rubbery or rigid consistency in less than seven minutes. So that's sort of ideal just for patient comfort, right? It's got to firm up or set within a certain amount of time. Ideally, also, it'd be the dimensionally stable. So not only over time, so if you want to pour the cast, let's say, an hour later or 24 hours later, we have the flexibility to do that, or even a week later, but also stable enough that when you separate the stone cast from the impression, it doesn't distort it such that you couldn't pour it a second time. So an ideal impression would allow us to pour it multiple times. Obviously, it's got to be biocompatible and then cost-effective um, so it helps your pocketbook. Okay. So the class of materials that we're going to use is in this elastomeric um, category. So we broke up our dental materials into the first two main categories. Things are elastic and things are non-elastic. We talked a little bit about this the other day, but what are examples of inelastic materials? Wax, because if you bend that, and that's going to break, right? Stone or plaster, that used to be an impression material. They used to make dentures uh, with it. That was inelastic, okay? So if you stretch that, that's going to break. So then we broke up the elastic category into two categories after that. And they were aqueous and non-aqueous, so water-based or not, right? So what are our water-based impression materials? Agar and alginate. So one's reversible, and then the, uh, the agar is reversible, the alginate is irreversible, they're both hydrocolloids. And then we get into the category of non aqueous elastomeric impressions, and these are all our polys. So there's polyether, polysulfide, and then the polyvinyl siloxane, PVS, is broken up into two different categories. So there's two different subtypes. One is addition. The other is condensation. We're going to focus on your polyvinyl siloxane because that's what we have in our clinic. Okay. The two major types that you'll see out in your rotations around dentistry is going to be PVS and polyether for your crown and bridge material. And we'll kind of talk about the advantages, disadvantages of each. But just know the polyvinyl siloxane, it crosslinks in the presence of a platinum catalyst with no byproduct. That's contrasted by your condensation PBS, which does have a byproduct. Anybody remember what that byproduct was? Ethanol. Very good. Very good. And then the other byproduct from polysulfide would be water. Okay. So that's why we try to harp on that pretty early. So polyether we don't use in the clinic, but um, you'll see this maybe in some rotation sites. It's a fairly somewhat popular material, um, and the key distinguishing factor is, so if you're going to remember polysulfide, remember this one thing, or two things. And these are the two most commonly kind of asked 
board type questions is one, the hydrophilicity, okay? Polyether is hydrophilic, and that's contrasted by PVS, which is hydrophobic. So we know that the oral environment is wet, so if you have something that is water loving, that's going to be more forgiving. You're going to be able to get away with a little bit more um, with the polyether in terms of fluid control. Okay. The other thing is polyether is the most rigid impression material that we have. So that plays a um, that comes into effect when we're trying to remove this tray or impression from the mouth. Because this thing doesn't really give, okay? So if you got, let's say, large embrasure spaces, you know, those little black triangles, and that impression material flows in between the teeth, you have a potential to get that locked in. Also, if you have a lot of missing teeth, right, that material also locks into all those undercuts. All right, so one of the things that you got to pay attention to is this idea of working time and setting time. So to kind of summarize those little points there, I think the easiest way to think about it is working time is the time that you have from the start of mix to when it should seat in the mouth. If you seat that in the mouth after the working time, you'll have some sort of distortion. Okay? The setting time is how long you got to leave that in the mouth before, from the start of mix until you can remove it, okay? So it takes, for the PVS reason, five minutes for that material to set up or to get rigid and firm, to run through the course of its reaction where it all cross-links together, okay? So polyvinyl siloxane will blend together with another PVS of a different viscosity, and if you put them together within the working time, they're going to blend together seamlessly. If you start one mix earlier and the other much later, and your working time doesn't overlap, guess what happens? They don't really blend together. So you can see in this impression, you see how there's a gap between your green, your light green and your dark green material? That means the two impression materials didn't set together because they were started and their um, working times didn't overlap. So you'll see sort of a junction here and here all the way around, meaning that that impression material was not um, set at the same time. Okay? And obviously we want that to set together so it's seamless. So these are working times and setting times for the PBS that we're going to use in our clinic. All right. Like I mentioned, PVS is going to come in different viscosities. So the ones we have in our clinic, we have an extra light, we have a light, a medium, and heavy. So what's the purpose of having differing viscosities? Well, one, if you think about the lighter viscosity, that flows much better. So that's going to allow us to flow into the little nooks and crannies of our preparation. So think about the contours of our crown prep. We got you know, a little, you know, we have the margin, we have the axial wall, we have our occlusal anatomy. So you want something that kind of spreads out and will kind of capture all that detail pretty easily. On the other hand, we also want something that's of a heavier viscosity because when that sets, it's much more rigid, okay? So the idea is that, think about all the chances that we have for distortion. Once that material sets, we have to pull that impression material out of the mouth. And we know that that engages some undercuts. So since it's elastic, the material will flex over those undercuts and release from the mouth. Well, in order to minimize the distortion that occurs in that flexing, we want that to rebound to its original state as much as we can. Something that is of a heavier viscosity will return to that original state much more easier, right? Okay, so we're trying to balance the two uh, properties. So one, you, it's good to have something light because it'll flow. But if you use the whole thing in light body, well, then it may distort much easier when you pull it from the mouth or also when you separate the cast from uh, the impression once it's set. Okay, so what if we add 
the base material, the uh, tray material, well, let's use something heavier. Okay. So the idea, too, is that the heavier material, when you seat the tray in the mouth, is going to push that lighter body stuff really down into the sulcus, if it didn't kind of flow in there. It kind of forces that down. Okay. So that's the purpose of having the two different types. And obviously, we want those to blend together when they set. Okay. So if the working time is validated, the watch, sometimes you'll, refer, you'll hear us uh, refer to the lighter body material as a wash material. Okay. Um, so if that working time is violated, it won't set in the tray material. A distinct separation between the materials will be seen and will lead to a distorted impression. So this is just sort of a definition. I'll just read this. It's this idea of viscoelasticity. So it just combines this idea that um, something is elastic, meaning it'll rebound. But it's also viscous in the sense that it has some flow properties. So if you strain it while it's flowing, it's going to um, um, kind of spread out a bit. Okay? So the takeaway from this idea of viscoelasticity is that PVS exhibits a time-dependent strain. So the principle you have to remember is that because this exhibits a time-dependent strain, the time it takes for you to remove that impression from the mouth I'm not talking about setting time. The actual act of kind of popping that out of the mouth matters. So if you do that real quickly, it's going to rebound real quickly. If you take your time and you just kind of wiggle, 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 that's going to have more distortion. Okay. So the idea of time-dependent strain, the amount of time it takes for you to physically remove that and get, you know, get over the undercuts has an effect on uh, the stability of it. Okay. With alginate, it has the same property. Um, PVS, uh, so that is, alginate is even more important that you snap to remove. Okay. Uh, PVS, for the most part, even though it's a time-dependent strain, if you compare it to alginate, will rebound much better. Okay. All right, so here's a principle that we want to achieve in making a great impression is this idea of creating space around our margin to really capture the detail of that. Okay? So we're going to have this um, retraction core that we're going to put into uh, the sulcus. So there's sort of two purposes for this. One is hemostasis or fluid control. It's probably a better term for it because it, not just heme, but any fluid in there. And then to create space. So we're going to teach you as a default this double cord technique. So we're going to put two pieces of what we call this retraction cord into the sulcus. So it's a predictable way to achieve hemostasis and create space for the impression material to flow beyond the margin. A smaller cord, so it has these different sizes. It goes the smallest is a triple zero. You can get up to a two, which is much thicker, is packed into the gingival sulcus first. So the purpose of the first cord is to prevent any fluid from seeping up. So you got potentially heme there, or blood, or your gingival curricular fluid that may flow up onto your tooth. And we know that PBS isn't hydrophilic, it's hydrophobic, so we want to minimize the amount of fluid that's there. Right? So when you pack this cord, well, you just want to pack it just the circumference of the tooth. You don't want to have a little tail sticking out or to overlap. Okay? So you'll cut it to the right, you'll size it, cut it, and then kind of pack it. So the second cord, the purpose of the second cord, and this is generally a larger one, and what I like to do is I like to get the biggest cord that I can fit there easily without having to really jam and damage the tissue. So over time and experience, you'll be able to figure out, you know, you'll look at the tissue and sort of, you know, is it thick or is it a thin biotype? Um, generally, I'll start with, I'll try to get a one in there as sort of my default. Sometimes I got to back it down to a zero. And the purpose of this is just to move the tissue out of the way. So we want to move the tissue away from the margin so that we can maximize the amount of impression material that flows deep into the sulcus. So just remember, the purpose of this is to capture a clean margin or to really expose our margin. So if you have a supra gingival margin, do you need retraction? 
No. Whereas if you have a subgingival margin, retraction is a little bit more challenging because you've got to go a little deeper to move the tissue out of the way. In this situation, we want that second cord to have a little tail because eventually we're going to remove that top layer. So it's easy to have a little extra there and you can, with your cotton pliers, just kind of pull off that cord. Okay? All right, so um, if you got some, um, another thing that helps us control the bleeding is these hemostatic agents. So there's two that you'll find in our clinic. One is aluminum chloride and the other is ferric sulfate. The brand names are Hemodent and Viscous Stat Clear fall in the aluminum chloride category, and then the ferric sulfate um, is Viscous Stat. So it's a little confusing because you got a Viscous Stat Clear and a Viscous Stat. Okay? Um, so those are, and they stop bleeding by kind of two different mechanisms. So aluminum chloride acts as a vasoconstrictor, whereas ferric sulfate will act by coagulating the blood. So if you uh, need to, and I always soak my cord in uh, hemodent, because that's sort of, it's just a liquid. So you'll cut the cord, I'll put it in a little dish, and then add hemodent to it so it's soaked in this aluminum chloride, so that when you pack it into the sulcus, that'll help control any bleeding that may occur. What's probably most, more important than actually this is the oral hygiene of your patient in a well-made provisional. So the healthier that you keep the tissue prior to your impression making, the better chance that you will have um, at getting a nice impression. So sometimes what happens is in your clinical experience, you're not gonna, especially in the beginning, you're not gonna be able to prep and impress in the same appointment. So they may return, let's say, the next day or in a couple days, and they're walking around with a provisional. So if you have a poorly contoured provisional, that may irritate the tissue, or if the oral hygiene isn't well maintained, that may irritate the tissue, you'll have some inflammation, and then now fluid control is much more challenging. So the presence of fluid is probably one of the number one reasons why we don't get a good impression. It contaminates that surface so that we miss our margin, or we miss um, the axial wall, or a bubble, something like that. So here's just a diagrammatic of the uh, double cord technique. So you can see that purple cord is our first cord. That stays in the sulcus, uh, whereas the, while we make the impression, while the top cord gets removed when we, um, uh, right prior to injecting the light body. So you'll remove the top cord, and then you're gonna use the wash material uh, the lighter body to make sure that that flows into the sulcus because we're trying to capture not only the margin but a little bit beyond the margin and into the uh, root surface. Okay. And this is a um, video of an example of him using the double cord technique. So before I play the video you'll notice he's already pulled, this is the top cord present, you've pulled the top cord and you see the amount of space that's separated between the uh, impression or the gingiva and the um, crown margin. Before you start injecting, you always want to take your mirror and just go through all the teeth. And if you can't see this big moat around your margin, and if you see any heme or fluid flowing up, just stop. It's not even worth trying because you got to wait five minutes for that material to set. Okay, so if you see anything that is not going to turn out well, it's not even worth starting the impression. You might as well just stop control the bleeding, and then reset, okay? This is a light body material that you're injecting. See him pulling the cord. And the bottom cord stays in. 
see the tray material that gets seated. So as that seats, the heavier body kind of pushes that even further down. Okay. So really, before we even make an impression, I think the thing when you look at these nice impressions is really, it starts with a nice prep. Look how smooth and uniform that margin is, right? Um, so if you can produce that, then obviously your impression technique is going to be much easier. So an acceptable impression always starts first with an acceptable crown preparation. So the finish line of the preparation needs to be come to a distinct endpoint and needs to be smooth. So the final impression should capture this distinct ledge that is formed apical to that margin. So here what I've outlined is actually where the crown margin is, and then this material flows beyond that. So that's important for us, and this is just another picture for it, for this reason. Um, look at how much space there is between that margin and the tissue. So eventually we're going to trim this die. Remember, this is called the die, the stone replica of the tooth. So when you start trimming this, this is going to be really easy for us to distinguish what is the tooth versus what is uh, tissue. Right? You know exactly where that should end. One other thing when you're evaluating this impression is you always have to think of the negative of it. Right? You're kind of reversing kind of what's going on. This is why we have you take the PATs just to see if you got this ability to do this. Because in dentistry, we do this a ton. So you see this little bubble here. And the first question you got to ask is, well, where does this, uh, where does this little defect, where does that exist in the stone? Is this going to be above or below our margin? So you have to think of the reverse, right? So what we find is this little bubble here results in this bubble here. So the next question you ask is, well, how is this going to affect my final restoration? Well, what we know is as we trim our die, anything below this crown margin gets removed. So the die ends up looking like this. So the answer to that question, well, it doesn't really affect our restoration, right? However, if you have a bubble on the inside here, like on the margin, or right at the junction, do you think that's going to affect our final restoration? Probably so. So just because there's bubbles in your impression or voids doesn't always mean that it's not an acceptable restoration. You have to think, right, the first question is, what is that going to result in? How is the stone die going to look? And then the next question is, well, is that discrepancy in a critical part of our uh, cast? Because if not, we can roll with it, right? So know that principle. So here's an example. We just pulled this from our lab. These are things that got sent to our clinic. So you can see in this area a really defined margin. You can see that material has flowed beyond the margin. It's going to be easy to trim this die in this section. You know exactly where that ends. So the tricky part about stone is that, well, it's not the tooth where you have tooth color and pink color. So if you don't have a good distinct line where you know where your margin is, we're guessing where that margin is, because you don't have any color. You don't know if that's tooth or if that's gingiva, right? So you see as we get to the distal here, that line in the material that flows beyond the margin is, isn't really there. So when we get to the stone cast, well, where does your margin end? I don't know, right? So this is an example where we didn't get good retraction in that area. So this will be rejected. We wouldn't be able to make a, we're guessing at the, um, finish line. And if you did make a crown, let's say you guessed, right, you have a potential that this won't seat or you'll have an open margin depending on which way it went. All right, another thing too is these voids on the axial wall. So you see sort of this discrepancy here results in a nice blob of stone that probably isn't on your tooth, okay. Um, so that's no good. And this is the same prep where we can see that the occlusal reduction is inadequate, right? So the student neglected to verify the reduction before making this impression. And the two ways that we taught you were um, um, using a 
chisel or an instrument that of a known width and putting that in between the teeth, or you can use some sort of registration material to score in between the teeth and then measure that with calipers. Um, what we can do now too is we have intraoral scanners. You can just like in your prep check, we can scan the tooth and then measure our reduction there before the patient ever leaves so we can catch some of these errors. Okay? And I'm going to finish up with this last slide just for our clinical protocol is that we're going to use alginate for our opposing arch. So the cost difference between your PVS impression and alginate is tremendous, right? It's like $25 for school price for one of those cartridges of PVS, much more expensive in private practice. Alginates is like pennies, right? Um, so for, you know, what's the purpose of having that opposing cast? Well, it's for our occlusion. So alginate is going to be accurate enough for us to kind of get our occlusion right. We need the extra accuracy on the prepped tooth because we need the surface detail of every little nook and cranny of that die. Okay? Um, so as a default, we do PBS on the side or the arch that you're making the crown on. Your opposing arch, we're going to do an alginate. Okay? And of course, that you need to pour up um, immediately. So you save that alginate making at the end of the clinical appointment where you can dismiss the patient and then go pour it up right away or have a classmate help you pour that up, okay? Um, so do that unless you're instructed. Sometimes some of the doctors on the clinic floor, they'll have you do both in PVS, uh, which is fine, but uh, get permission, get the okay from them before you do that. As a default, we have you doing alginate as you're opposing, um, okay? So I know you guys pay a lot in tuition, but not enough to cover PVS for everybody all the time.